she is an actress. She is a stand-up perhaps best known for her work with a little-known comic performer called Ricky Gervais in, in Derek and particularly in, in Afterlife. But there is a lot more to Kerry Godleyman. Oh, I'm so sorry. You. I'm so, I'm so sorry. Please don't let this affect all things going forward. <laughs> Kerry, I, I believe in second chances. I do. I mean, we're in a climate of many chances. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I am willing to put this down to, to us years from now saying, of course, we had an inauspicious start. <laughs> yeah, please let this just be a fond memory one day. I, and yet, Something look at us we now. We, 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 we ended up doing a fantastic TV show together and then we got married. Who would have predicted it? <laughs> That's it. That's the outcome. It will be a quirky sort of Richard Curtis-esque. Yeah. Little yeah. funny start. So I, I do I do have to ask you, though, was it as it was with David Duchovny, he of the X-Files and California Cation, was it simply that you forgot you were talking to me? Maybe a tiny bit. I <laughs> knew it was in... The, I knew that we had it in, and I just... Today's been one of those days, and it did slip my mind. It's in my diary, and my agent just rang and went, what's going on? We, this was all sorted out. Anyway, I do apologise. Kids coming home at half past three. <laughs> We've got builders in. Yeah. It's that kind of time of day. Well, I can trump this. I was once booked to be on Michael Ball's Sunday morning Radio 2 show. And I know Michael enough to think of him as a sort of sort of friend, you know. And I just yeah. I just totally forgot about it. Totally forgot. Oh, God. A car waiting outside. And uh, <laughs> so I think I was woken up to say, you do this, so I ran down, got in, did the first part of the interview from the car on the phone and then mm. into the studio for the last bit. And and Michael would say this publicly, he wasn't pleased. Oh God. So it did it was a problem. It didn't it did affect the actual thing. Well I think for something like that, you know, radio two show, it's you you're the big yeah, guy. Bad. And your blooming guest who who happens to be another Welsh bloke, which I think, you know, because he's from yeah, Wales, it's enough. like you think, ah, oh, it's one There's thing. Anyway. It's one thing if it's Bruce Springsteen who's coming in to talk to you, you know, but it, it was me <laughs> and I yeah, he was um And he was a bit like, Come on. Let me say something as well on a technical level. Could you come around a bit so the light is not behind you? Yeah. I can do yeah. all those things. You'd yeah. think after two years of the pandemic, I'd have nailed all this tech business, wouldn't you? I'm always surprised by how many actors that I've spoken to on this don't really get that, you know? No, I, you, I mean, because actors are toddlers, aren't they, essentially? Well, this is an interesting area to talk about. I was just, <laughs> before you, and I don't know which order these will go out in, but I was talking to Reginald D. Hunter, who... Uh went to RADA as a summer student from America. I forgot he went to RADA. Was going to be an actor. And then we got onto this theory of mine that acting is a very childlike profession. Absolutely. It infantilizes you, the lifestyle. Yes. And you, of course, are in a very good position because you straddle, if that's not too provocative a word. I'm happy with straddle. Good. Uh, uh, because you, 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 you know, similar to me, similar to Reg, a bit of both. And... What I love is the autonomy of stand-up comedy. Me too. I would not like now, at this stage in my life, to be at the mercy of the slings and arrows. Do you like that little thespy quote? The slings and arrows of uh, the acting profession. I like doing live. I like comedy. I like stand-up. It anchors me to something I can control. But I'm, I'm sort of talking about it when you get the job and it can be a nice job mm. and you get picked up at the crack. I mean, there'll be people watching this going, what are you moaning? But I'm going to say it anyway, right? Because, Kerry, this is my truth. Uh, you, <laughs> you can go, um, you, you go in early, you get put in your little trailer, and I mean little, and you, you get given your clothes. Some, sometimes, depending on the size of the project, somebody helps you get into them. And it's like a child. And it, and it's Absolutely. I think as you get older, definitely, you do start to think, this isn't civilised. It's, there's no dignity in it for a grown-up. But I, I do... I'm st we're stuck with it now, Rob. We're, 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 we're doing it. <laughs> we're not going to have a sudden career change now. But you've got a, you're in a lovely position, aren't you? You you must be you must be very pleased with how things are now because even just the most cursory glance at your CV resume, what whatever you want to call it, you, you go, oh look at that, oh she's doing that, oh and she's doing that. That that's that seems like there's a lovely balance for you. 
Yeah, I think so. It is really lovely. I do feel extremely lucky because especially doing the drama side, like because sometimes it's lovely doing comedy and scripted comedy as well as stand-up comedy. But now I get to do sort of quite hard-hitting drama stuff. I do feel really lucky that I can do that. You've always worked. Was it the Ricky factor that 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 pushed everything I think so. to another level? I think it must have been because I'd always... I'd always had what I felt like were two careers because I, I went to drama school and did all that. And I always got like odds and sods, like little bits and pieces in acting, but never a break, never something that sort of pushed it up a bit. And then stand up. I was a circuit comic for a long time, like over a decade. And I'd had a nice, I had a nice life working in the clubs and, and literally having two jobs. Like they just both happened to be in performance, but they just didn't really ever cross over. And then I think it was working with Ricky that meant that, both comedy and acting just both went up again. It was like getting, it was like getting a promotion at work. If I did have a real job, it was like a promotion. It's extraordinary that, that how the response to Afterlife, and also that he's done three seasons because he never does three. So it was, yeah. it was a sort of extra surprise that he did another one. And how did the relationship go then? So, you, so when you first started working with him, did could you sense him going, oh yeah, no, we we we've got a really nice thing here could could you feel that or was it always a surprise when he'd come back to you for another thing when we were doing Derek yeah there was a lot of good rapport like we all got on because a lot of us were comics David Earl was on it and yeah. Brett Goldstein it was quite a happy ship in that sort of mucking about and fairly relaxed what were your nerves like in the early days of the stand-up how nervous would you get yeah it'd be on my mind all day very nervous I had, I had a gig last night, quite a sort of what could have been a tricky one, like a corporate one, and they were being a little bit rowdy. And I, I had a moment where I was really happy to notice that I did, I wasn't nervous because I can remember in the old days that would have really like wobbled me, and I'd have it, it would have been physical, you know, that physical sensation. Yes, of, yes, of, <laughs> yes, of stage fright. And I think people that don't do that, who have never done that by which I mean the majority, sort of everybody else, yeah. must hear that, must hear comedians talking and think, my God, why would you put yourself through that? Why would you, But you the know... feeling afterwards is worth it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it is worth it. Yeah. The buzz is quite, quite a good buzz. Making a room full of people laugh is there's sort of almost nothing as lovely. You've got a show now that you've toured. This is Bosch. Yeah. Bosch UK. Yes. You, you've toured this before, so it's all bedded in and it's lovely. Mm -hmm. and, and you're coming back to it in when? Autumn. So I was doing it before the lockdown and then I revived it after the lockdowns. And it went really well and I really enjoyed it. And it sold very well. And it came to an end and I just didn't feel ready to put it away. I just still felt like it was a show that I wanted to keep doing. So we put some more in. That'll be this from September, October time. Yeah, from September, just uh, just for autumn, really, a few more. And what what type of a thing is it? The title of it is from... I got the nickname when I did Taskmaster. So um, my approach to Taskmaster... Have you ever watched it? Do you know what the yes, sort of show... Yes, of course. Yeah. Right, so the, the nature of the show is that people's individual personality sort of comes out. So if you're a bit kind of... You, my tendency is to be a bit abrasive and impatient and get the job done. And Greg ended up nicknaming me. He was like, oh, Bosch became a bit of a nickname for me. So I kind of talk about some of that in my show about my tendency to have those personality traits and how sometimes that's that's good for things like stand-up comedy and getting things done. It's quite effective. But also it's not enormously effective when you're trying to sort of, you know, console a friend or raise a child. <laughs> so it's there are sort of shades of like when these things are useful and just our per personality stuff. And Oh, good God. Did you see that, Carrie? Look at that. Oh, excellent. Excellent. Oh, oh sweet Lord. Is that a denim shirt? Yeah, that's horrific. Oh, Look it's too hot for a denim shirt, Rob. But I it's can't. Far too I, hot. I can't take it off. You I think that jumper on. That's sending out a very different message if I take it <laughs> off. <laughs> that is bold. I bet there are people that do just sit with a top off on a Zoom <laughs> while communicating on a Zoom. Yes, I'm pretty sure there are. <laughs> but 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 it's not that sort of show. Not um, that sort of show. I didn't um, mean. I'm, I'm sure it goes on in the webcam capacity. Yes. <laughs> Hang on. Let me, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to rethink this whole bloody interview. Hang on a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Let me let me just get that. I'm not judging. I think you should just not worry about it. 
Yeah, there's okay. No, there's no shame here. It's a all safe right. space. I, I'm going to sit like that. How did it all start for you? Were you always one of those kids that was going to be an entertainer? Oh, po probably. Yeah, <laughs> I think I think I probably was. I just always liked performing and like my mum and dad indulged it. Because not all do. It can go two ways. There's plenty of performers. And sometimes I think that people attribute their success to the fact that the parents were. Exactly. I was just lucky. My mum and dad always did indulge it. They gave me lifts to my drama clubs and they laughed at all my jokes. Uh, there's a great line that uh, Jimmy Tarbuck said to Steve Coogan uh -huh. when Steve appeared on something like Live from the Palladium in the 1980s. And Steve is a young up and coming guy. He tells this story of Jimmy before he goes on. Jimmy saying to him, oh, he said, young man, he said, young man, this, this business, if it works out for you, it's a great life. And he said, and if it doesn't work out for you, it's still a great life. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, that is, that, although that's not true, it's a lovely <laughs> sentiment. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've, I've known a lot of heartbreak. I've known a lot of people, friends that I started out on this journey with that it hasn't been. A All right. Great well, life. then, so it's it, it's utter rubbish, but it's lovely rubbish. It's a lovely sentiment spoken from the, the from the perspective of someone who had a highly successful <laughs> career. How did it start for you then? How, so how did I it did I did like youth clubs, like youth theatre and um, stuff like that around around where I grew up, and just really loved it. And then when I was there, there were a few kids that were older than me that were already talking about this thing called going to drama school. So I got a sniff of that and um, and tried tried to go and, and got, got got through, got got had an audition and got in and really loved it, really enjoyed drama training. And then when I left, I, I did get an agent and I did get li a few little jobs, but I didn't get loads. And it was quite challenging, that unemployment and finding other ways to make a living and feeling a bit lost, really, because it, it is difficult being unemployed an unemployed actor because there's it's not there's not an enormous amount of sympathy for you because you've sort of chosen this life then after when I graduated and it was quite challenging for one reason or another not in a um terrible way just in a normal way it was just hard to kind of get work that's when I started thinking about stand-up and I did a course at the city lit after about maybe a year or two after I graduated me and a friend did a adult education course in stand-up at the city lit college you did one of those tell me two practical things that you learned from that well I do remember the teacher saying I can't teach you to be funny but I can help you build a comedy set so that if you want to have a go at being a comic you can go out on the open mic circuit and do that so he was it it was never you know about teaching people to be funny but he would we would play kind of drop what we would know as drama games in a way of building material so you'd like write lists of things that wind you up and I still know comics that might do this now yeah. if you just force yourself to write a list of 10 things that you're furious about yeah. some of them could be the beginning of a routine yeah. you know and yeah. you just build material and he'll get you on stage just talking stream of consciousness and then you'll start to have that kind of musical ear for where the rhythm of a joke is or where the comedy bits are and where the boring bits are and then you cut the boring bits out and leave the funny bits in and paste it all together. You're just sort of exploring and talking about different styles of comedy. And again, similar to drama school, you're sort of legitimizing what seems like a frivolous profession. You're saying, no, hang on, let's see if you can do it and make it your job. And then once we did that course, we had a gig at the end. And then once I'd done my first gig, that was it. I just had the bug then. And I just- Really? I got the Time Out magazine and I put, a, I circled all the telephone numbers where it said, open mic and I rang it all and just started on that journey of of filling my diary with open mic gigs. What about some of these meaty drama roles? Are there any of those well, on the horizon? Well, yes. Whitstable Pearl is a uh, show that I do on Acorn TV where I play a detective in the town of Whitstable. Yes. We've just shot a second series of that and that will be on at some point in the autumn, I think. Yeah. And I got... I did hear that Trigger Point will be going again, so maybe we'll be making some more of those next year. Yeah. So things things bubbling along. I don't know for definite yeah. any dates, but something. But listen to you. 
I've got my tour in the autumn. I think Trigger Point's going again. I've got Whitstable <laughs> Pearl coming up. It's pretty good, isn't it? It's really, really lovely. I'm very excited about it. They're exciting things to look forward to. Listen, that's been really nice talking to you. Really it's nice been talking so to lovely. you. lovely. And I apologise again for being late. I wish we'd had more time. Do you know what? I'd, forgo I'd forgotten about that already. Oh, I, I'm glad. I, I think we got over that within about four or five minutes. I'm glad. But now that you've reminded me... No, um, I, don't forget it. I didn't mean it. I just I feel very affronted. I didn't want any bad... <laughs> I didn't want Very any bad nice. feeling. I'm sorry. I feel I feel, I feel hurt. Um, <laughs> I, I can't help thinking you've never been 20 minutes late for Ricky. That's the, that's the thing I keep coming back to. Hey, listen, It's lovely to meet you. Really nice to meet you too. Go back to your family, have a lovely time, and then a busy autumn. Lovely yes. talking to you, Kerry. Thank you. Take care. Lots of love. Bye-bye. I'm doing a very strange wave. I don't know why. Why the hell am I doing that?